Bruce is the executive director of the Great Lakes Shipwreck Museum. If you've been up to Whitefish Point in Michigan's Eastern Upper Peninsula, you have likely visited uh, what is his probably a second home. And interestingly, he started his career as an historical interpreter at Fort Mackinac on Mackinac Island in 1989. And he later returned to work full-time for the Michigan uh, Mackinac State Historic Parks. He graduated with a degree in American history from Ohio State University. And then he uh, participated in and was accepted into Eastern Michigan University's Historic Preservation Graduate Program where he studied, studied oh, heritage interpretation. And before he graduated from EMU, he completed an internship at the Great Lakes Shiprock Museum. And he developed a real passion for Great Lakes maritime history. And during his career, he's worked at the Alfred P. Sloan Museum in Flint, uh, the Pyatt Castles in West, Barry, West Liberty, Ohio, and he was also hired as the Ohio Historical Society to assist with the creation of an economic impact survey of historic sites for the Ohio State Legislature. So you can see his experience is quite interesting and, and far reaching. And I think most many of you might be interested in picking up his book. In 2015, Bruce co-authored a book along with award-winning Great Lakes Maritime photographer, Chris Winters, the book called the legend lives on, and it's a richly illustrated meditation on the Edmund Fitzgerald. Bruce is married to his wife, Jill, and she's a veterinarian in Sault Ste. Marie, and they've got six children, not surprisingly, four chows and two cats. So it's good to have a veterinarian mom. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm not very, human children, so. <laughs> I, I'm very uh, pleased to welcome Bruce, and um, I will make a quick note before Bruce starts. He is happy to answer your questions. So if you want to enter questions into the chat room, if it fits the topic that's at hand, I'll interrupt Bruce if it's appropriate. And um, if it's not, then we'll wait till the end of the um, presentation to um, answer Bruce's questions. So thanks so much, Bruce. You, the table is yours. Thank you, Barb. Thank you for that uh, kind uh, introduction. And uh, thank you also for the uh, invitation to come and talk a little bit about Whitefish Point and shipwrecks and the life-saving service. So I'm going to go ahead and see if I can get the screen shared here. We'll see how we do. So how's that? Oh, Barb, I think you're muted, but I think you that are was perfect. Okay, good, good. All right, well, thank you again and welcome everybody uh, to this presentation, Braving the Waves, the US Life Saving Service on the Shipwreck Coast. Uh, this is originally a program I did for the Michigan Historic Preservation Network. Uh, a couple summers ago, before the pandemic, uh, they have their UP History Conference, typically that uh, takes place somewhere up here. And uh, they were in Escanaba and they asked me to talk a little bit about the Life Saving Service and that this is the program that I came up with. So um, it's about, 650 slides, so kick, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. It's not that many slides at all, but I'm probably looking at about 70. But what I do with this program is talk a little bit about the, uh, the reasons for the shipwrecks. I talk about uh, some early shipwrecks that led to the life-saving service being uh, established on the Great Lakes. And then I talk about a few more and you kind of get a before and after, before the life-saving service and after. But let me ask real quickly, you know, I'm used to doing this in front of a crowd of people looking at me, but um, I'll ask a uh, question that you don't necessarily have to answer, but I'd be curious to know how many in the crowd, and I have the feeling this group is uh, interested in history, so you're probably going to be more aware than most, but uh, the awareness of the life-saving service. Um, it's, I find that up at Whitefish Point, when we talk about the life-saving service, I could have a group of uh, 50 or 60 people inside of our surf boat house. And I would ask that question and I'd be lucky if two hands went up. People really are not, uh, most people are not familiar with the Life Saving Service. So you could call it a forgotten chapter uh, in maritime history in this country. If any of you have visited Britain, they have their uh, Royal National uh, Life Service. What do you guys want? You hungry again? And in, in, in some ways, it's it's almost like a predecessor to the Life Saving Service in the United States. Is the rain so making you nervous? Uh, we actually have Coast Guard today, and I'll talk about that transition 
uh, how it went from life-saving service, and revenue cutter service to uh, what we call the Coast Guard here today. So as Barb said, and this is my second slide, uh, I work at the Great Lakes Shipwreck Museum. I'm the director there. Um, and I think many of you probably have visited. We're not too far away, about an hour and a half northwest of the Mackinac Bridge. And this image you can see right here, you see the Whitefish Point Lighthouse. That's the oldest operating lighthouse on Lake Superior, built in 1861. I, I think that's, you know, even if you're not a history geek like I am, it's pretty cool to think that this lighthouse was being built during Abraham Lincoln's administration and it's still operating today. So uh, the Coast Guard comes up periodically and they check on it, but it is automated to be sure. And uh, you see the ship passing in the background there too. Uh, that's very typical of the commercial ship traffic. I'm sitting inside what's called the Historic Weather Bureau building. I'm actually in Sault Ste. Marie right now. So what you see here with the lighthouse at Whitefish Point, that's our primary location, our primary uh, historic site, but we have a second one that's at, in Sault Ste. Marie uh, on the grounds of the Sioux Locks, and it's an old 1890s era Weather Bureau building. I'm sitting in that building right now. I'm, I look to my left, I can see the locks. The ship just went through a few minutes ago. So the ship traffic is actually uh, actually underway. Um, this picture, you know, I've got to say it's 65 degrees here in Sault Ste. Marie right now. I'm not sure. You probably have warmer weather even down there right now. It always makes me chuckle when we have this first day of warm air uh, and sunshine. People are out in the, you know, locks park walking around with tank tops on and shorts and uh, everything else. So it's kind of comical. I, I don't think it's that warm, but uh, yes, it is. It's warming up. So if this image you see right here on the screen uh, is what it will look like pretty soon at Whitefish Point. This is what it looked like just a couple weeks ago. Um, I took that picture and our snow is only just, just going away with some of these nicer uh, conditions uh, that we have. And this, this lighthouse really represents the beginning of what we call the shipwreck coast. I have to be careful about this. There are a number of people that call it the Shipwreck Coast, but historically that's a relatively new uh, name for that stretch of shoreline that goes. And if you take a look at the screen right here, I don't know if you can see my cursor. I think most of you probably can, but that's Whitefish Point right there. So the, the thing that you can notice here is, and the Sioux Locks are like right over here, all of your ship traffic coming in and out of Lake Superior must go past Whitefish Point. So what happens is when they're out in the big lake, out in Lake Superior, all that commercial ship traffic as they're approaching Whitefish Point, they're getting it into an area where it narrows pretty dramatically. Now, if you're visiting Whitefish Point, you're sitting on our observation deck and you look out uh, you know, across, you see Ontario 20 odd miles away in the distance, it looks pretty broad. But if you see what they're coming from, all that ship traffic and what they're getting into, there's an island right there that's called Parisian Island. There's a lighthouse there too, it's a Canadian lighthouse. Uh, but uh, it gets a little narrow, and that explains part of the reason why this has come to be known in areas, either the graveyard of the Great Lakes, even though there's a dozen or so areas that are called the graveyard of the Great Lakes, or what we now call the shipwreck coast. So ship traffic and collision was a big problem in the early years. Uh, we get a lot of fog, and we get some pretty nasty weather conditions, which I think you can all probably imagine. So you combine all of those, and we can't... Um, discount human error in this equation of this formula and you have roughly 200 shipwrecks going from Whitefish Point all the way to the area of the Pictured Rocks National Lakeshore. You can maybe see that just a little bit that's Grand Island and there's a lighthouse on the northern tip of that as well and there's the East Grand Island light. Chris Point is kind of right in this area. So this area came to be known as the Shipwreck Coast. And like I said, over 200 shipwrecks right in that area. There's another problem here too. If you look at this area, there's no natural harbors. Grand Marais is one, but pretty small. And a lot of those ships couldn't get into that area if they were in trouble. So a lot of times, and some of the shipwrecks we'll talk about here today, uh, a lot of times those ships would get driven ashore right in that area. And there was nothing. And prior to 1876, there was really nothing at all. If any of you've walked in some of those areas, and uh, when I was in high school, I walked from Whitefish Point. I don't think my family, and I certainly didn't realize how long of a walk that was gonna be. I did it one day to Vermilion and back to Whitefish Point. It's about 12 miles. So I walked almost like Hi. Uh, and there was really nothing out there. Um, and so there's nothing out there now. So it tells you that the desolate aspect of this area is carried through today. But if you look at the earlier eras of shipping on the Great Lakes, 
clearly, if a ship ran aground, there wasn't a whole lot, especially if the weather conditions were bad, that a crew could do to help themselves. This is a more modern uh, image, uh, Google Maps here. You can see Whitefish Point here, Sault Ste. Marie here, Grand Marais, that's part of it. You can just see part of Grand Island uh, right there in the Picture Rocks National Lakeshore. So that whole area, again, take a look at that image. You can see uh, that really uh, no place for a ship to go uh, if it were to get into trouble. Mackinac Island down in this area too. So uh, that kind of gives you an idea and it gives you uh, ideas as to why ships were getting into so much trouble. Of course, there's one ship that everybody thinks about, one ship wreck. Um, and that would be the Edmund Fitzgerald. The Fitzgerald went down 17 miles northwest of Whitefish Point, and obviously the crew of 29 that was on board disappeared with it. Uh, that ship disappeared so quickly, there was no distress signal. I, I'm sure we've all heard the song by Gordon Lightfoot, uh, and really, Mr. Lightfoot did a really good job of telling that story. He's got it mostly accurate. He, uh, made a couple of little adjustments at the request of family members, believe it or not, surviving family members uh, from that crew of 29. So it tells you how seriously he uh, you know, took that story and uh, he wanted to make it, um, he wanted the family members to be on board with it, so to speak. But again, that's the reason uh, I would say arguably that most people come up to Whitefish Point, at least those that are interested in learning more about shipwrecks. They, they know about the Edmund Fitzgerald and we see it as a big part of our mission to uh, tell them about the other nearly 6,000 shipwrecks on the Great Lakes, or in our case, we tend to focus a little bit more uh, on southeastern Lake Superior and the uh, couple hundred shipwrecks we have right in that area. Many of them are in shallow waters. Uh, we even used to have a, at the Shipwreck Museum a kayak tour that would go over some of the shallow shipwrecks. Some of them could be in five, six feet of water, dozen feet of water, that kind of thing. So. Now, let's, let's shift gears for a minute. We just talked about the Fitzgerald, that was 1975, but I wanna go back in time a little bit and talk a little bit about the first uh, real era of commercial shipping on the Great Lakes, and it would have looked something like this. Uh, if any of you visited Colonial Michelin Mackinac, that's in Mackinac City, or even Fort Mackinac, Mackinac Island has a fantastic exhibit. It's called Mackinac Island Famous in These Regions. Uh, that Michelin Mackinac and that particular exhibit at the fort on the island tend to talk a lot about uh, the fur trade and the Europeans coming into these areas of the upper Great Lakes and how much money was being made. And uh, uh, if you think of the beaver felt hats and things like that in Europe at the time, that was high style. But the, the point in showing this slide was this was the first uh, form of commercial ship traffic. Think of those 30 foot long Montreal canoes, canoes filled with trade goods and fur bales things like that. If the weather went south, well, you might see something like this, where they'd be able to pull that canoe up onto the shoreline uh, and get out of trouble. That wasn't always the case, and as we proceeded forward through the years, the commercial shipping started to take a look, or started to look something like this. Uh, this is a barkentine, really a uh, schooner uh, with a uh, square rigged foremast. Uh, this was built in 1866 in Milwaukee. It's actually one of the shipwrecks that I'm going to be talking about uh, as we do the presentation here, but, and we'd call these tall ships today, but this is more of what the shipping started to look like. And then by the way, time we get to the 1840s, and uh, this is a, uh, an artist conception, an artist by the name of Kelpin uh, painted this. This is a vessel, if you can see on the stern there, it's called the Independence, uh, really the first steamer on Lake Superior. You take a look, and for those of you who have been to Sault Ste. Marie, you'll see one of these actual propellers uh, on display in Locks Park. But this vessel, uh, 1845, this image is depicting, it's being portaged before the locks were built. They had to portage some of these ships. I don't know if any of you have ever portaged a canoe before, not that difficult. But if you're portaging a ship, this could take weeks on end, and it would have looked something like this on what is Portage Avenue today. Uh, in Sault Ste. Marie. Once they got it onto the Lake Superior side, that was it. Uh, it was gonna be steaming uh, on Lake Superior and it was gonna be hauling supplies out to some of these uh, far-flung uh, you know, communities that were growing on Lake Superior. And like so many other early steamers and ships in general on Lake Superior, this one had a share of accidents. Uh, groundings, uh, this ship was a little bit underpowered. It was originally built to be used for the transatlantic grain trade, but it was so slow, it was said that it could be outpaced by a man walking. And it also, they said uh, about this vessel that it would require so much 
coal in order to get it across the Atlantic. It just, it wasn't going to work. So the owners decided to try it out on Lake Superior. And for a number of years, it actually worked quite well. But uh, by late November, 1853, like so many of these early ships, the uh, independence came to grief, uh, so to speak. Uh, this this uh, painting, uh, which the original is on display inside the Shipwreck Museum itself, it shows you what happened on the night of November the 22nd, 1853. A boiler explosion de destroyed the independence uh, not long after it left Sault Ste. Marie. So it was still in the St. Mary's River. Uh, the Upper St. Mary's River and on its way out to Whitefish Bay. And it was one of those infamous last trips of the season. If you ever read about a lot of these shipwrecks, it seems like in a lot of cases, it would be the last trip of the season. And uh, it makes you think, you know what? If I were around in the 1870s or 80s, I don't think that I would ever get on any of these ships that were taking their last trip of the season unless I had no other choice. Because it seems like so many of them had troubles in the process. And the independence, no exception. Boiler explosion, a number of people, a number of the crew were killed. Uh, but there were a number of survivors uh, as well. And part of this vessel is actually on exhibit inside the shipwreck museum itself. If, uh, if some of you remember that diver display we have in the corner, well, they appear to be floating over the keel, part of the keel of a vessel. That's actually the original keel that was brought up out of the St. Mary's River uh, of the Independence. So right there it is, it's actually inside the gallery. Kind of cool, people don't always realize that as they're going through. But that was 1853. By the time we get to 1855, the Sioux locks are opened up. It's almost like um, floodgates opening, so to speak, in that now shipping was increasing dramatically on Lake Superior those locks uh, enabling uh, ship traffic to go from that lower Lake Huron level to the higher Lake Superior level uh, now made it a much quicker proposition. No longer were they uh, portaging uh, <laughs> vessels uh, and it was a much quicker process. And with the increased shipping, uh, scenes like this were not terribly uncommon. There was some damage to one of the lock gates uh, and take a look at all those ships that are backed up. And uh, that gives you that image kind of gives you an idea of how much ship traffic was actually operating far more than what we have today. You know, if we see a dozen ships off Whitefish Point in a, in a space of two or three days, uh, those of us that are boat nerds, and there's a lot of us, we get pretty excited, but we can't imagine seeing anything like this. And even with some of the uh, maintenance work uh, or uh, problems that there have been in recent years with the Pollock uh, here, uh, in Sault Ste. Marie, we still would never see this many ships uh, waiting to go through. But with more ship traffic, there's one thing guaranteed. Statistically, you're just going to have it. If there's more ships on the lakes, guess what? You're going to have more shipwrecks. And this is an example, one of the first examples that I'm going to talk about. And what it does is it illustrates the need for the life-saving service. And what you see in this picture, uh, November 1872, these are two these two vessels you see, there's actually three in the picture. It's not the best, not the best photograph, but this is prior to 1872. These two vessels, the Jupiter and the Saturn, uh, and you can see a vessel right here getting to uh, ready to tow them. These were purpose-built schooner barges, and these vessels were designed uh, like in a lot of cases you'd have a schooner or even a barkentine like the Nelson that would have the masts cut down, and it would be kind of retrofitted, if you want to put it that way, where it was a schooner in its own right. Now those masts were cut down and it was going to be towed by a steamship. And that was more economical. You could have less crew on that schooner barge. And uh, But in some cases in later years, they actually built purpose-built schooner barges. They still had masts like the Jupiter and the Saturn. Uh, so if they had to, they could rig up a sail. They'd have a crew. So if they got into trouble, they could try to do something about it. I, I, I'm doubting that most of us here have heard of the great storm of 1872. Uh, if you are familiar with shipwrecks on the Great Lakes, uh, there's a lot of uh, great storms that we could talk about. Uh, the great storm of 1913, which hit the entire Great Lakes, and dozens of ships were destroyed in that. There was the Armistice Day storm, 1940, or there was even a storm in 1905. Uh, that sank a number of vessels on the upper Great Lakes. Uh, but the, the Great Storm of 1872, a little bit less well known, but if this were the turn of the prior century, chances are we would have heard of it because there were a number of shipwrecks uh, that did get into trouble in that storm. And two of those vessels that sank, and they were in the area of Whitefish Point, uh, 
and the area of Vermilion, where one of the original life-saving stations were being built or ended up being built, uh, they got into the trouble right in that area. And that had something to do with where those life-saving stations were actually constructed. Okay. You can take yours away. It's interfering. I think we've, uh, somebody might need to put their uh, mute button on there. But uh, back to November 27th, 1872. You can see a picture in the lower right hand corner. If you can see that, that's a steamship called the John A. Dix. And the two, uh, you see the Jupiter and the Saturn right here with those short masts. Well, they had left Marquette uh, the day before. So November 26th, 1872, with a load of iron ore, they were downbound. They were headed to the Sulox. The Jupiter and the Saturn, and there was another vessel called the Mars. These vessels were all owned by a Detroit businessman by the name of Eber Brock Ward. Many of you probably have heard of him. Uh, he owned these vessels as well as a lot of other ships. And uh, they had left uh, November 26, 1872 under what could best be described as unseasonably warm weather. And if uh, any of you are very familiar with the story uh, of the Edmund Fitzgerald, on November the 9th, 1975, it left Superior, Wisconsin with the same description. The weather was gorgeous, perfect, unseasonably warm, exactly the same kind of situation here with the Jupiter and the Saturn and the John A. Dix. But by the time they were getting closer to Whitefish Point, uh, as happened on, under really so many other circumstances or situations, uh, they, the weather was getting worse. Uh, the wind was kicking up, uh, gale force winds, uh, uh, waves were getting larger, larger. And again, this is November, uh, so freezing rain, snow, and uh, ice was really forming on the, uh, the vessels themselves. And not unheard of, not uncommon in situations like this, if you would have a vessel like the John Dix pulling the Jupiter and the Saturn, if the weather got bad enough, it might get into a situation where the tow line would part and the tow line would break. So that was why you wanted to have a crew on board that ship to try to save it. Um, and they, uh, again, they had sails, they could try to rig up that kind of thing. Well, let's keep moving ahead with that. Like I said, Marquette, uh, this is not Marquette, but this kind of gives you an idea of what it would have looked like when they were departing. So you can see the tow line uh, right there. Um, and as they were pulling out and heading east, as I said, the weather started to deteriorate um, and get worse and worse and worse. Uh, in Sault Ste. Marie, and I know I have been in situations where I think about modern ships out on the lake when the wind is blowing really, really hard and you, we might see five, six, eight foot waves crashing in off of Whitefish Point. And it, 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 you know it's dramatic out on the big lake. Um, there might even be times where we see four or five ships waiting out in Whitefish Bay and some of them might be 1,000 footers. Uh, that tells you the weather's pretty dramatic. There is a description that I found in a newspaper, uh, Sault Ste. Marie newspaper. Guy Carlton was interviewed uh, after these ships sank, and he described what the weather was like at the locks when the Jupiter and the Saturn and the John A. Dix were out there in Lake Superior battling their way, heading east and trying to get to the locks. Guy Carlton, he was superintendent of the St. Mary's Falls Ship Canal, uh, or also known as the Sioux Locks. He wrote uh, and said, it blew fearfully, uh, accompanied with a blinding snowstorm and cold. One could scarcely look to the windward. It came from the westward, veering occasionally to the northwest. The water and the ice were driven from the lake and the river above into the canal at a fearful rate, and water rising completely over the lock gates, filling both the locks to their utmost capacity and overflowing the canal banks. So if it was that bad in Sault Ste. Marie, imagine what it was like out on either Whitefish Bay, which wouldn't be quite as bad as Lake Superior, but it must have been terrible out in Lake Superior. And that's what those crews were fighting their way through. Eventually, so I mentioned that the idea that these tow lines could part, this is exactly what happened. And I say eventually, by the time the Dix and the Jupiter and the Saturn were getting closer to Vermilion, which is about a dozen miles west of Whitefish Point and getting closer to Whitefish Point, just in the vicinity of Vermilion, the tow line snapped for the Jupiter. So that crew, they were on their own. And uh, the captain of the Dix uh, said that they lost sight of them pretty quickly after that tow line snapped. And so that was right in the area of Vermilion. And then they were getting closer to Whitefish Point. So they were 
probably, and the captain uh, of the Dix was praying, I'm sure, that not only would his own vessel make it, but that of the Saturn. But, but within a few miles of Whitefish Point, the tow line on the Saturn snapped as well. So he lost both of those vessels that he was towing. And here's what ended up happening. And that is not the Jupiter or the Saturn. Take a look at the American flag inverted right there. Look at the crew up in the rigging uh, there. A scene like that would have been very much uh, what would have happened to the Jupiter and the Saturn. They were driven, uh, not exactly sure, but sandbars. There's a lot of sandbars in that area up there. And some of the crew actually survived. The wreckage of the Jupiter was found about 12 miles west of Vermilion, and the Saturn was found, the wreckage, uh, in, in about uh, three miles west of Whitefish Point. And it's pretty sad to think some of the crew did survive. They actually made it to the shore, but there was nowhere for them to go. They were out there in the elements. There were no cabins. There was no, there was nothing out there for them to get in and out of the elements and they perished from the elements alone. So this first um, shipwreck story that I'll tell you about, there's actually two other shipwrecks that were involved in this. Uh, there was one called the Charles Griswold and the W.O. Brown also sank in the same storm. So right there, you had four shipwrecks in one storm. Uh, between the Jupiter and the Saturn, 15 people died, 14 male crew and a female crew on board. So it was a uh, kind of a dramatic ending, really. And it made people think, especially after they found, that they found out that some of the crew survived, there must be something that can be done to try to help in these situations. If this is what they looked like uh, there in the storm as they've been driven ashore, this is what the Saturn, I'm sorry, the Jupiter looks like now. It's only in about a dozen feet of water. And uh, depending on, uh, this is a picture taken a number of years ago, but depending on what happens during the winter, how harsh of winter it is and the ice flows and the sand shifting and things like that. There have been years where that vessel has uh, uh, been exposed more uh, at that depth of maybe 12, 14 feet of water. But then there has also been some years where it just completely disappeared. And uh, there's a line uh, that goes down to it that would let us know where it is. So Daryl Artell, that name may be familiar to some of you. He's our director of marine operations at the Shipwreck Museum. Um, and he took that photo. So that's that's a little bit what it looks like now. A lot of these are very diveable and they're in, in very, very shallow depths. Now, let's go back to that question that I just posed a few minutes ago. That's obviously the Whitefish Point Lighthouse. Kind of looks like Whitefish Point, right? If for those of you who've been up, uh, you know, those of you who've been up since the 19 teens, which would be all of us, it looks different now. Uh, that picture, notice the color of the tower. Uh, it's a dark brown, almost a black color. Uh, that's the original lighthouse keeper's quarters there. There was a lighthouse keeper by the name of Charles Kimball. He was from there from 1883 to 1903. 20 years, right, as a lighthouse keeper at Whitefish Point. And uh, his successor, a man by the Robert, name of Robert Carlson, was there from 1903 to 1931. So you've got two keepers in a row that were there for a long time. Uh, Carlson wasn't much of a photographer, but Charles Kimball was. And this is one of his photographs that you can see right here. And the point in putting this slide here at this part of the program is to uh, illustrate, in essence, the fact that lighthouses were great for guiding that ship traffic, right? They're aids to navigation. But if a ship gets into trouble, you know, some of your early and your 1902, 1903 instructions of the lighthouse keepers do have segments in there that, that indicate that a lighthouse keeper would got a message saying that I was. Can everybody hear me okay? I apologize. I was trying to mute somebody who was just joining us. Oh, that's okay. That's all right. <laughs> I think my wife tries to mute me sometimes as well, but uh, not in the middle of a program though, right? So, but back back to the, uh, back to Whitefish Point, back to lighthouses, what lighthouse keepers did, right? So they were responsible if they could to help out a ship in distress. And there are some stories of that at Whitefish Point where Robert Carlson, as an example, uh, did save a crew off of a small steamer that uh, turned over near Whitefish Point, but that wasn't their primary duty. Uh, their primary duty was to keep that light lit from dusk until dawn. And if the idea of going out and helping a ship in distress somehow affected their ability to keep that lighthouse operating, then they weren't, uh, they weren't supposed to do it. They were supposed to stay with the lighthouse. Uh, 
So we think in terms of what is the, uh, what's the answer um, at this point? And the answer in this case would be the United States Life Saving Service. This, as I said earlier, was a, uh, this entity, government entity was, um, maybe you could say it's almost like a brother entity to the, the Lighthouse Service. Well, in this case, the goal of uh, crew that were uh, part of a life-saving station, their primary duty was to keep an eye on the lake or the ocean or even the river in some cases to see uh, if ships were getting into trouble. Or even, you know, if you have your own personal boat and this were 18, uh, you know, 95 or whatever, and you're out there and your boat gets into trouble and there's a life-saving station nearby, they would, like the Coast Guard does today, they would, they would try to help you. So that was their, that was their mission. The life-saving service, uh, some of the beginnings of life-saving service can be kind of nebulous in a way, um, because you had different communities, especially on the Eastern Seaboard, they were starting their own uh, really life-saving stations, if you want to put it that way. They were creating their own. They were often manned by volunteers. Uh, think of a volunteer fire department, kind of a similar idea. And they could go out and hop in a boat and go help somebody in distress. But that's not really an ideal situation, because if these volunteer uh, life-saving crews were at home, well, you had to get the, you know, get word to them that a ship was in trouble. And by the time they could all assemble and get a boat and launch it and get out to it, well, often that would be too late. Uh, we start to get into the early 1870s. And uh, this is a gentleman by the name of Increase Sumner Kimball. He was the only general superintendent that the life-saving service ever had. Uh, for 44 years, he was in charge of the life-saving service, and the man was, uh, all he was missing was a cape, in a way. He was like a superhero. The way he took uh, what were stations all over the country that might have been lost in bureaucracy, ineffective um, equipment, shoddy equipment, uh, just a lot of problems. And during his tenure, he was able to uh, really um, transform what was a loose uh, kind of series of stations uh, because the federal government had been investing in stations prior to uh, his coming on board, but he took, uh, took it and really turned it into what it came to be, a very, very efficient uh, series of stations all over the country. And um, it was during his tenure, obviously, because he was the only general superintendent, that our first four life-saving stations ended up appearing uh, up here. Uh, uh, up on Lake Superior, up uh, on what a lot of people up here call the North Shore. It's really the south, Southeast Shore, but I guess you could say it's the, the North Shore of the Upper Peninsula, but starting in this area. So you had four life-saving stations built along this area that we call the Shipwreck Coast. There was uh, one right here in this area of Vermilion. That's, like I said, about a dozen, 12 miles west of Whitefish Point. And these four stations were built 1876. They were operational by 1877. The next one would be Chris Point, so they would be right in this area. There was actually a life-saving station there before there was a lighthouse. I think a lot of you probably visited the lighthouse out there, Chris Point. And when you visit out there, that kind of gives you a feel for the desolation, how you're out there on your own. And I have no doubts that some of these young life-saving service crew members, when they got sent out to some of these locations, thought they were being sent to the backside of the moon. There was nothing there. Uh, if you were at a life-saving station in Chicago, uh, you could meet girls and go to restaurants and you had a community around you. If you were up there at Chris Point or Vermilion, there was nothing, 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 nothing out there. There's nothing today. Uh, so you had Vermilion, you had Chris Point was next, and then you had the Two-Hearted River would be next, and then Deer Park. And if any of you have ever been out to Muscalange Lake, there's a state camp area there. That is on the site that uh, Deer Park or Muscalange Lake Life Saving Station is right out in that area. Grand Marais eventually ended up getting a station after the turn of the century. So you started to see, much like the lighthouses in these areas to guide ship traffic, you started to see the construction of these life-saving stations and then later Coast Guard stations uh, along that same strip where ships were getting into trouble. At Whitefish Point, we never had a life-saving station, never. Uh, I drill this into our staff all the time. We, we had a lifeboat station different. It was a different era. It was 1923. At that point, the life-saving service didn't exist. In 1915, the life-saving service and the revenue cutter service combined to become the Coast Guard. And so Whitefish Point, it wasn't until the Roaring Twenties uh, that we ended up getting uh, a station much like a life-saving station. 
These four original life-saving stations on Lake Superior, the four originals built in 1876, all looked exactly the same. They were all built from the same Lake Superior type station. They had the same architecture. Those stations tended to evolve a little bit as the years went on, but this is Vermilion. You can see right here, and they all had that station house right there. And I'll show you a few more images of those in a second. Chris Point, uh, notice uh, exact same. And then we get to Two Hearted River and Deer Park. They all had the same look. They had a little bit of fret work, a little bit of design work that you would see there at the uh, getting towards the end of the 19th century. Uh, it's interesting how government entities, government buildings back then, uh, had uh, little bits of flourish to them. They wanted to. Uh, put their best foot forward, I guess, and have a little bit of design. But that's what those stations look like. You can see right there, very small. Eventually boat houses were constructed and, and even little uh, cottages, little cabins for some of the life-saving service crew members and their families that might be out in some of those areas. Really, really tough duty stations if you wanna put it that way. But if we think about 1876 for a minute, and uh, if we have any uh, Old West historians in the group here, uh, July of 1876, you had Custer out there with uh, his group at the Little Bighorn. I don't know about you, but I would rather be at a boring life-saving station that had a shipwreck every so often than be out west uh, with uh, what it came to be known as the Indian Wars that were taking place out there. And I have, this is another thing that I work with my staff on because these, um, these life-saving service crew members were not getting rich. Um, and I think in one of Fred Stonehouse's books, he coined a phrase that they were heroes on 93 cents a day uh, because of, they weren't getting paid a lot. Uh, they had uh, food and housing allowances taken out and things like that, but they were still making considerably more than a private in the US Army was. And uh, a lot of those enlisted personnel in the Army were out West at that point. So you, you gotta keep your perspective with this stuff and it's all relative, I think. But uh, I think for these crew members that were out there, it's that old cliche of it, there'd be a lot of boredom in a lot of cases punctuated by sheer terror uh, as they were going out to try to rescue uh, a crew off of a ship. But those are the four original stations you can see. Barb, looks like you've got, uh, maybe a question came in. Yeah, while you're talking about staffing of the stations, typically how many people would, would have been at each station on a full-time basis? Sure, that's a good question. So you'd have the keeper, he was the guy in charge. You know, we think of lighthouse keepers, but also the gentleman who would be in charge of the station was a keeper. And then you might have a crew of seven or possibly eight. Um, occasionally they would have transients that would come and go that would train with one station and then maybe get shipped off to another one, that kind of thing. Um, but they weren't huge, they weren't a huge crews uh, that would be out there at those stations. Um, and then you would have, uh, aside from the crew, you would have families uh, that would be out there as well. So we'll talk about that. But yeah, you would have to have a minimum of crew of six, but I've read about some of them having seven, eight, uh, and maybe even a few more in some cases. So if you take a look at this elevation right here, architectural, uh, you can get an idea. This is from a group called SOS Vermilion that I'm a part of. The Vermilion Station, and that's, as you can see at the top of the image there, it's the last one. It's the last of those four original stations. And our small kind of a grassroots effort group is working to preserve uh, this last station house. Uh, the property at Vermilion now, uh, these days, owned by Little Traverse Conservancy, uh, but they have uh, worked out a uh, an agreement with SOS Vermilion, whereby we can work and preserve and own this structure why they own that land. If you take a look at it, uh, there's the facade right there. Look at this design work. I'm, I'm sad to say that over the last winter, this design work only just fell off. Uh, even though we had a mild winter, uh, it, was, it was enough and that thing has been <laughs> attached to that peak since 1876. Uh, so it only finally fell off. We've we have uh, some of our folks snowmobile out there every so often to just check on the condition of it. And so they saw that and we were able to get it inside. So we still have the original part of it. Uh, but if you take a look at this little building, imagine that crew of eight is what we might say. This part right here, I keep losing my pointer here. Uh, this point right here would actually show where the keeper and maybe uh, his wife and family would live. Very small room. I've actually walked around up inside the second story of this uh, this life-saving uh, station house. 
I probably shouldn't have done it because it's not very safe at this point, but I really wanted to see what was up there. And some of the members of SOS Vermillion and myself have gone up onto that second floor. And so very small room, but that would have been the housing for the keeper and his family. And then if you look at this east side of it, uh, that would be in this area, but back in this area would be almost like a, a mini barracks where you probably would have had small bunks and that's where the crew would have stayed. Uh, and then this other section right here, you can see where my cursor is, uh, that was where the boat, where a surf boat would have been kept and they would have launched it kind of strange in a way because uh, most of these, maybe if you look at the life-saving stations that came afterward, most of them had the boathouse facing the water. So they could just pull it out, get it right out of the lake. They'd be on rails in some cases. Um, but that gives you an idea of what those original structures would have looked like. Now, take a look at this picture. This is one of my favorites. You can see the original Vermilion uh, Station House right here on the left. This is a lookout tower. That would be manned for the most part 24 hours a day. Uh, think about the era we're talking about here. This could be 1870s reading leading up to the turn of the century. So your eyes and sound were going to be the same, the, the ways you were gonna know if a ship was in trouble. You'd have a crew member that would be up there and he would have binoculars, he might have a telescope. He'd be watching for flares at night. He'd be watching to see, and if you saw a flare, that's a good indicator that there's a ship having a problem. And then if they did see a ship having a problem, they had all kinds of tools they could use to get out there and try to rescue a crew off of a ship that was getting ready to go to the bottom. You take a look right here and towards the bottom, that's a surf boat. This is one of their favorite tools. And if you uh, look at that, there is a crew of eight right there. And there's the keeper in the back. They've got their cork life jackets on. They've got their summer weight uniforms on. And uh, that crew of eight with the keeper, and look at this giant long oar, uh, that's called a sweep. That was how the keeper would have steered that boat. These boats were about 25 feet long. Uh, I've seen references to them weighing anywhere from 1,100 to 1,300 pounds, but that was considered pretty lightweight. And compared to the Royal uh, National Lifeboat, uh, I always get it. I, I always forget what the uh, British version is, but they still have their lifeboats and surf boats, uh, like I was saying today, where we have the Coast Guard. This surf boat was more of an American invention. And this was something that was more unique to the American shorelines and particularly on the Great Lakes too. Uh, like I said, weighing in about 1,100 to 1,300 pounds, very maneuverable, very, very maneuverable by a crew. Your keeper would be in the back. And once that crew launched this thing, sometimes they would have them on logs or rollers that they could push it out. Sometimes they'd have them on a carriage with a team of horses and they could back that carriage up with the surf boat in it right down to the water and then get that team going forward and the boat would just almost pop right out of the back of it and they'd all jump in and start pulling on those oars. They could be pulling on the oars and some of the shipwrecks that I've read about and rescue attempts, hours at a time, they could be pulling on those. Uh, and they could handle about 12 people, maybe more, uh, in one of these if they got close enough to a shipwreck to get the, get the passengers and crew off of it. But this is a really great photo to illustrate um, the crew would not stay at the station throughout the winter, but the keeper would. So notice the pile of wood next to the station house. And of course, it could be the middle of the summer and we could have temperatures getting down into the 40s at night, that kind of thing. So they burned a lot of wood and they had a ready crew to cut it up. And some of those crews came from, and that, that's actually a good segue to, to talk about where the crews would come from. In a lot of cases, these would be local fishermen. In many cases, they would be uh, lumberjacks logging team members that, that uh, would want to try something different, uh, not surprisingly, and sometimes the life-saving service, but, but particularly they wanted uh, men that knew how to handle boats and had had experience working with boats. The other thing I'll show in this picture, there's a couple things. Uh, right here, you can see that pole, almost looks like a mast right there. There's a bell you can see right up here too, a chair somebody might have if they're getting a break, and then these ladders very close to the chimney right there. The bell, of course, would be something that could be, uh, you know, it's pretty obvious. You're, it's, you're using sound again to set that alarm off. Uh, if a uh, crew member heard a steam whistle in the distance and, uh, you know, certain whistles, certain signals would tell them a ship was in distress, well, they'd use that bell to alert the rest of the crew. This, that looks like a mast, was actually called a drill pole. And there's a tool they had. It was a small cannon called a Lyle gun that they would actually file a fire a projectile 
at a ship to help the crew. I love getting elementary school groups up at Whitefish Point and I spell that out to them. I say, that makes sense, right? You fire things at people when you're trying to help them. And uh, some of the kids pick up on it and they're like shaking their head, no, that doesn't make any sense. And then that gives you the opportunity to explain it. Uh, but I'll talk about the drill pole here in a minute because there was a small cannon called that Lyle gun. And I'll give you a little bit of that story. Uh, now, the ladders, if I had all of you in person in front of me, I'd ask why do you think they had ladders going up to the roof? If any of you visited Fort Mackinac, the soldiers talk about that a lot too. Uh, coincidentally, those ladders are very close to the chimney and that's typically where those chimney, that's typically where a fire was gonna start in that area. So that would allow them to get up on the roof to put the fire out pretty quickly if, uh, if one started in that area. So this is Vermilion and let's go on to our next slide here. Uh, another image showing the uh, a bit of the facade of the uh, Vermilion Life Saving Station. I mentioned they had families. They a lot of them had dogs there. So I'm amazed. I, I love it when I can see dogs in some of these pictures. This is a keeper by the name of Carpenter. And uh, he looks like a pretty formidable character there. And a lot of these Life Saving Service crewmen were. And uh, I get the idea he's one that if he gave you an order, uh, you were probably going to be following it pretty quickly. There wasn't going to be a lot of debate uh, going on there. And they, they had to, the keeper had to implicitly trust his crew and vice versa. They were a team that worked together and that crew would look to their keeper, in this case, Carpenter, uh, for all of their instructions in, in action and on their other days when they had training going on. But I love this picture. If you look in here, it's a summer day. Everybody's wearing their finest. Um, you've got the crew again in their summer weight uniform. There's a dog right there leaning up against somebody. Uh, getting petted there. And look, you can see blinds and drapes there, windows opened up, uh, that kind of thing. It speaks to life at Vermilion and these other life-saving stations. It was a lonely spot, but I have no doubt uh, that a community would form there. There would be some sense of uh, transience with some of these younger life-saving service crew members that would be coming and going, but a lot of them had their families there and they had uh, you know, little cottages, little cabins that they would build they were allowed to do that by the life-saving service, but they were not allowed to sleep in those cabins. They had to sleep at night in the station because what they didn't want to have to do is if there was a ship in distress, they had to be as quick as possible. They didn't want to go rapping on everybody's doors. Wake up, you know, get up, you know, it's time to go. They, they wanted them right there in the station. But take a, one last good look at that picture. It's probably one of the best I've ever seen that kind of illustrates that family life that would be up there. Uh, in that very, very remote station. Here's another image you can see of the surf boat right here. Uh, and they're getting it right out there. This is, I believe this one is Vermilion. And again, you see a very close look at the uh, summer weight uniforms. Again, a 1300 pound boat. So it was no lightweight. Uh, these boats were very intricate. Uh, they had valves that could be opened up and in the uh, below the deck uh, of these boats would be a, a, a reservoir, like a tank that could take on water for ballast. Uh, that kind of thing. And then they could drain it out when they got it back onto dry land. They could rig these up for sailing, believe it or not, too. Uh, the surf boat we have inside of our surf boat house at Whitefish Point has the sail, the mast with it. Um, all kinds of interesting aspects. And again, these were a favorite on the part of the Life Saving Service because of the maneuverability. There were what were called lifeboats that were bigger, heavier, took a larger crew, uh, maybe could withstand more punishment, maybe. Um, those tend to be more a reflection of what they were using in Britain, uh, but this surf boat uh, was a favorite of crew members. Maybe not during certain times of the year, though. Um, I don't know if anybody would want to be out rowing around. Uh, you know, that's Vermilion in the background. This is after 1915. Look at the ice flow uh, you can see right there. Very, very challenging work. But it must have been a warm day because they're not they're not really that bundled up. So it was probably one of those spring days uh, where it gets up to a certain temperature and they're getting a workout. Uh, this is Coast Guard. If you look at the bow, you can see U.S. Coast Guard. If you look at the stern, you could just barely make out Vermilion and you can see the station house, part of it in the background there um, and a boathouse back there too. Actually, that's that's more of a boathouse. You see the station house uh, in, in this particular image would be further to the right. Uh, but it tells you the kind of work that would go into it. One thing they wouldn't do is what you see in these pictures when there was that much ice out there. So every Tuesday, every Tuesday, they would do what was called boat drill, where they would take these boats out, these surf boats, 
and they would have friendly competitions. This is actually out in unison, you can see right here. Take a look at the swimsuits that they're wearing uh, there, but they had to do boat drill because these boats might have been self-failing. There were scuppers that would allow that water to rush out, uh, but they couldn't right themselves. Uh, they were not self-righting, so the crew had to do that. So if they were out on a rescue mission and that boat got tipped over and that happened not infrequently, they would have to be able to do this without thinking about it. It wasn't like they wanted to have a manual out there reading how do we how do we roll this thing back over again. Uh, and so they had training that, and they could do it in a matter of seconds in some cases. And in some cases, the keeper could uh, be on the stern. He wouldn't even get his feet wet. So they were so proficient. And this speaks to the kind of uh, discipline instilled by Sumner Kimball that I was telling you about, the, the uh, general superintendent. And it became friendly competition uh, in some of these areas. So I mentioned they had a weekly routine. Uh, I mentioned they had training and let's, we'll go through some of that briefly. Beach apparatus, this is the Lyle gun that I was telling you about. We'll go into more detail on that in a second. Boat training, I just showed you an image of what they would do. If the weather is too harsh, those keepers and later the uh, gentleman or the individual in charge of a Coast Guard station uh, would, would they, they had some latitude there. They didn't wanna kill their crew off just by trying to do the training, but they did have to train them, period. Wednesday signal practice. Again, you could be signaling ships uh, offshore, that type of type, wigwag, if you're familiar with that, and flags and things like that. Friday uh, practice of the restoring the nearly drowned, almost like CPR uh, that we have today. Um, and then Saturday, they did their housekeeping. So weekends, um, you know, they had a little bit of time to step away from that training. And uh, they would clean up the station house, they clean up their cottages or cabins or what have you. And then Sunday, you had a day of rest where they didn't necessarily have to, uh, to do any more training. But you have to keep in mind behind all of this and all this training, if they're in the middle of signal practice and uh, they hear the bell ringing up in the lookout tower, watchtower, that means the ship's in trouble. So they still had to be able to snap to and go out and uh, do something to help uh, that situation. Here you can see a beach cart. So go back one, you see the beach apparatus. The beach apparatus consisted of uh, that little cannon you see right there, which if you look closer, you could see one right there. This is what's called a beach cart. We have a reconstructed version of one of these on display inside of our surf boat house at Whitefish Point. This is what they called Norwegian steam, uh, where they didn't have horses, they didn't have a bulldozer, they had some of that stuff in later years. But that crew pulled that beach cart through the sand. And uh, this could be over 2000 pounds worth of equipment that they're pulling through that sand with a beach cart like this. You see they've each got a line attached to them. They look very excited uh, to be doing this uh, <laughs> at this point. Some of them are almost smiling. Uh, I think this guy in the, in the kind of the center right here, he looks like he's almost got a smile on his face. But you can see the Lyle gun right up there. And then there's a box there uh, that had the line that would be fired out of that cannon right there. The line, a very lightweight, what was called a whip line would have this, if you can see my cursor, it's a 19 pound projectile. This would be fired at the ship with the idea of getting that projectile and the line attached to it over the ship and into the rigging to where the crew could pull that line in. There you can see right there. And uh, you remember I mentioned the drill pull, step back for one second. I mentioned the drill pull in that image of Vermilion. That's what it was for. And the drill pull was for training. So they'd fire that projectile with a line attached. You can see right there. And uh, that would enable them to practice on dry land to try to become more proficient. So what would happen next, right? So you fired this projectile with a line attached and go over the mast of a ship. And then you might have a scene that looks something like this. And this was very intricate. It can often be incredibly difficult to try to explain how all this works, particularly even when we have the beach car in front of us on our surf boat house up there at Whitefish Point. But it's better sometimes to show pictures to help us understand how this works. You'd have that line that would be shot out over the ship. The crew would have to help with this. The crew of the ship would have to keep their wits about them. They'd have to pull that line in, rig it up, especially that first whip line onto a mast of the ship. This is not maybe the best image to show, but it does show, it illustrates how the breeches buoy, which was the next part of the puzzle would work. The, that line, the light line would be brought in by the crew of the ship. The crew of the ship would, uh, or the life savings, service crew rather uh, would tie a heavier line or a hawser to that lighter line. And then you would have a couple, 
Well, let me just show the picture here to best explain it. You would have uh, this heavy hawser uh, line actually right there, a mid-weight line that would have been brought out by the whip line, and then you'd have a traveling block on it. And, and basically suspended from those lines would be what's called a breeches buoy. It's like a life ring with canvas pants in it, sewn into it. And if you're on that ship that's about to break up and sink, uh, that may not sound like fun, especially if the winds are blowing 60 miles per hour, you can't even hear anything because the wind is blowing so hard and you're freezing to death. But the idea of staying on a ship that's about to break up would be less uh, preferred, I would think, to getting into this breaches buoy, being suspended over the lake or the ocean, east coast, west coast, and you can see right there, there's a breaches buoy in action. There's a schooner barge right there that's been uh, driven ashore. You can see people come out to watch. They're getting the crew off the ship. And this illustration does a nice job of showing what it would like for the person or what it would look like for the person inside the breaches buoy and as they would be sailing over the wind and the waves, or the waves anyways, as they're on their way to the beach. There would be, I'll go back one. This is called a crotch right here. This is two boards that were brought together and you see the V right there that would suspend that line up over the water as it goes out. Uh, to the ship itself. Now, let me speak to this for a second. This is what's called a life car. And uh, there was a company, uh, Francis, uh, Francis Metallic Life Cars, these were called. They used the same idea as a breeches buoy. But the idea here is they would stuff five, maybe four or five people down inside of this iron, uh, iron <laughs> vehicle that looks almost like a little, something out of Jules Byrne. Uh, you know, uh, that type of thing. It'd have a little hatch on the top of it. All your life-saving stations and those that we talked about on the Shipwreck Coast had these as a part of their uh, inventory. But I don't have much of any accounts of these being used. I think they were too heavy. They probably weighed, if I remember correctly, around 1,100 pounds. So it's a lot easier to take a Lyle gun and a breeches buoy out. But these things were heavy four or five people, once they were secured, the first versions were airtight. So if you were in it, you better hope that crew knows what they're doing. Um, but the other ones had little holes <laughs> that you could breathe through uh, in them. And you would get beat up pretty badly uh, if you were in one of these. But again, if the alternative is being part of wreckage that's getting washed ashore and you're in, in with flotsam and jetsam and you're drowning and getting beaten by timbers from a ship, this is preferable. But it was a life car. Uh, there's one that circulates between museums uh, here in Michigan, and we're due to get it again pretty soon. We, we can exhibit that people. We have a little step that you can, you know, step up and look down inside of it, imagine being put inside of it and being pulled off of a shipwreck. So it's, again, it's a very interesting and I think a fascinating part of the tools that were used by these life-saving service crews to try to get people off of their wrecks. They had all their tools, um, but the most basic part of their job would be to patrol the shoreline. You see the gentleman on the left, that's a uh, life-saving service crew member, and he's out on his beach patrol. It's the very most basic part of their job and what they would do. Um, so they, they would walk as many as two, three, maybe even four miles in one direction and turn around and walk back. And this could be, think of November conditions. Think of if the shipping season is still going on. Think of spring conditions with the ice and the snow and how, how nasty the weather really can be, how rough it can be. And also um, we have them now, there's wolves up in that area and uh, the wolves back then were far worse than they are now. So, but it was said that the wolves were afraid of the surf. They were afraid of the shoreline. So they tended to stay away from that. But talk about a lonely job and walking on that beach and what could be a dangerous job at times. They would have a light uh, that would be right here. They would use that to guide them, you know, maybe a walking stick. Uh, this guy really looks the part here, too, with the mustache uh, that you can see. He's got his uh, oil skins on there. And what he would do is he'd keep an eye on that lake. And if he saw a flare go up, he had his own flare that he, he could fire off, or not necessarily fire off, but hold in his hand. He'd hold it up in the air and signal that crew or the captain on the ship to let them know that they'd been seen. And then possibly, uh, depending on the distance from the station and how far away this crewman was, the lookout in the look in the watchtower might see that flare and might see the corresponding flare coming from the uh, the uh, crewman who was out walking the beach. So they had their own communication system that they could use with lights, um, uh, with uh, sound using a bell uh, or even signal flags, that kind of thing. 
And there's the Vermilion, the first Vermilion watchtower you can see on the right with some of the crew uh, that you can see there too. I love that picture. Uh, there's a great book uh, by Grace Truman. Uh, I'm not sure if any of you know Grace. Um, uh, she would kill me. She's the president of SOS Vermilion. I can't think of the title of the book right now, but Grace Truman is the author. And so if you want to read more, if you uh, were to Google Grace Truman and Life-Saving Service, the title of her book would come up. And then also Fred Stonehouse that I mentioned earlier. Fred really, I think, has done more research than just about anybody to illustrate and bring to life uh, and to light the history of the Life-Saving Service on the Great Lakes. And there's a book that he published called Wreck Ashore, Wreck Ashore by Fred Stonehouse. It is a book that sadly is going out of print now. We just found this out a couple weeks ago, but I think you can still find maybe on Amazon, uh, maybe in uh, different uh, museums around the Great Lakes, you might be able to find copies of that. Our, we sold all of ours last year because we actually talk about it a lot inside the museum buildings and people wanna learn more about the life-saving service and they buy copies of it. But I would say, Barb, if anybody um, approaches you wanting to know more about the life-saving service or books, uh, send me an email and I'll shoot back another email that has titles and authors and things like that. So there's a lot of good books that are out there. Uh, but Wreck Ashore is one of my favorites and I got to talk to Fred about allowing that one to go out of uh, print because we can't get enough of them. We can't keep them on the shelves. Um, so Vermilion, let's talk about that again for a second. There you can see, this is what that original station house looked like a few years ago. Uh, my family, even though I grew up in Ohio, and I have to say, I'm happy that Nobody cursed me when Barb said I went to Ohio State. Uh, usually if I'm in front of a crowd, I start dodging things, uh, that kind of thing. But, but I grew up in Ohio, but my family's had a little place south of Whitefish Point since the 1970s. And one uh, recollection that I have is going out to Vermilion. Uh, there's a sandy road that goes out there. It's never in good shape. But you can get out there if you have a four-wheel drive. And, and these days, I think, if the beavers aren't damming up the road, you can get out there if you have a two-wheel drive uh, as well. But you can see uh, you, you can see the condition. If you look here on the left, uh, that's when it was an operating station. This is what it looked like probably five years ago. Uh, so the fact that it's standing and relatively straight, that is a testament, I think, to the builders. And because the winters are not easy up there. But if you take a look at the website, and we welcome new members all the time, sosvermilion.org. Uh, Barb, I could include some information on that too. We're just a little grassroots group. There's not many of us, but we do an annual meeting every fall up at Whitefish Point inside of our lifeboat house. And we talk about various aspects of the history of the station and the life-saving service on Lake Superior. So, but the primary mission is to first stabilize the structure and then eventually restore it uh, to a point where it can become a small visitor center of sorts uh, right up there at Vermilion. Now we're gonna shift gears again here. This is a big transition because if you remember, I talked about the Jupiter and the Saturn. I talked about how some of the crew got ashore and, uh, but they didn't survive because there was nothing there. This is a uh, vessel called the Phineas Marsh. And uh, the marsh actually uh, typical of so many of these shipwrecks uh, got into trouble under relatively similar circumstances to the John A. Dix and the Jupiter and the Saturn. It was a bigger schooner. Uh, this one was hauling uh, sandstone blocks uh, out of Portage, out of the Keweenaw Peninsula, basically, coming from that direction. Uh, downbound, it was kind of an unusual late August, late August 1896 storm. Typically, we're hearing storms in November, right? Storms in the fall, but we get storms in the spring. We get storms, uh, you know, midsummer, in this case, late August 1896. And uh, very similar again, it had left the Keweenaw. Decent weather when it left uh, as it's getting closer to Whitefish Point. And in this case, Chris Point, uh, this ship got into trouble. And the captain of the ship started firing flares off. He knew his ship was taking on water. It was coming apart at the seams. This ship had fought its way across the lake. Uh, it was, was getting relatively close to Whitefish Point. But by the time they were abreast of Chris Point um, in 1896, that's before the lighthouse was actually there. Uh, they started to get into trouble. And I actually have an excerpt from a newspaper of the day that I'm going to read from. It's better to have those eyewitnesses and in their own words to tell a little bit of the story. Uh, and the Chris Point station, there was a keeper by the name of Small. R.M. Small was his name. And uh, one of his crew saw a flare. So we'll get right into the shipwreck part of it. 
crew saw a flare. It was at night. They knew there was a problem. Captain Small decided, okay, we're going to use the surf boat. You know, these keepers would have to use their best judgment. If the ship was far enough offshore, then they would have to use a surf boat. If it was within a couple hundred yards of the shoreline, then they might use that Lyle gun and breach his boy. But there just happened to be a person who was at the Chris Point station that was interviewed by a Sault Ste. Marie newspaper after the fact. And uh, he was described this way. And I'm reading this verbatim right out of that newspaper. It, this individual indicated Captain Small gave orders to launch the lifeboat without slightest delay. He person means a surf boat. The wind had been blowing a gale uh, from, the, from the Northwest all night and a heavy sea was running. But before four o'clock AM, while it was yet dark, the lifeboat was fighting her way out through the breakers on her way to the rescue. But a pole of nearly a mile had to be made out into the lake to get outside of the breakers before the boat could be headed up the lake. Then after a heavy pull of five miles, they were opposite the vessel, which then was flying the stress signals, it being daylight. The lifeboat was backed in as quickly as possible for the vessels already showing signs of sinking. Their yawl had been previously lowered, but only withstood the huge seas that were tumbling in for a moment. It was lying bottom up astern of the vessel. Just as the lifeboat was dropping alongside and before a line could be thrown on board, the vessel rolled heavily to starboard. Then, after slowly riding and with a death-like struggle, she buried her bow deeply under a heavy sea, took a tremendous lunge to port, and went to the bottom. Six of the sailors succeeded in reaching the mizzen rigging, but the other two and the woman was carried astern and almost buried in the debris. A moment and they would have all been gone, unquote. Now, this article goes on and on and on, but it gives you or this, this eyewitness account, which makes me wonder if it was one of the life-saving service crew because they were several miles offshore when all this was taking place. But it kind of gives you a feel for what was going on out there. They were able to back that surf boat in and eventually Captain Small and his crew rescued the entire crew, and including those people that were almost buried in the debris that that eyewitness had uh, referenced. Matter of fact, um, let's see here. Fires were started. I've made some notes here. Fires were started. This was referenced to warm the victim and surfmen alike. A much needed repast, this is in quotes, was now spread and served with hot tea and coffee, thanks to the kindness of Mr. and Mrs. Colhane, who had thoughtfully sent a wagon to the nearest camp for a goodly supply of eatables. Uh, and then also the Two-Hearted River crew knew about this and they came out as well. So you had two crews that were gonna help. If you get that bit about five miles on pulling on those oars to get out, they pulled the entire crew off the vessel. This shows you the difference between, and not that this always meant that a crew was going to be rescued, but the difference between the situation with the Jupiter and the Saturn and the John Dix and the uh, difference with this vessel, the Phineas Marsh, and how the Life Saving Service crew was, they were able to do their jobs and they rescued the crew off the ship. Had they not been there, this was an August storm, mind you, so the weather would have been better. I don't know if any of you have gone swimming in Lake Superior in recent years. Uh, it's not really that much warmer than it ever was. Um, it's very cold, even mid-August at this point, much less a shipwreck we're going to talk about here in a minute that was in May. So let's hit the next one here. If I can get my uh, next slide to go. Okay go back for a minute. This is, these are remnants of the Phineas Marsh that you can see right here, right now. Uh, again, Daryl Artell, our director of marine operations, took a lot of these photos. Look at the dead eyes there. It's more of a wreckage site, but you can see a good section of the hull uh, right there. So it was offshore, and in this case, Captain Small and the Life Saving Service crew from the Chris Point Station used their surf boat to rescue the group. Uh, this particular book you can see right here. So the Life Saving Service, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, was a, uh, it was a federal entity, federal government. And so like the Lighthouse Service, they had reports that would be put forward. And in many cases, these reports had detailed accounts of these shipwrecks. And the Phineas Marsh is one in particular where the next year, 1897, I was able to do some research and find uh, references from Captain Small and his vantage point on that night. So they would have to sit down after that shipwreck, after the crew from the vessel had been taken care of and all their equipment is back and cleaned and put back in order, ready for the next rescue. Captain Small would have to sit down. There was a certain level of bureaucracy to this. Sit down and fill out a very lengthy report on what would have happened uh, that night and have all that information handy. Now, we're gonna shift gears again here. And um, that was 1896 we were talking about. 
I'm going to move forward to 1899. And the reason I want to talk about this particular shipwreck, partly it's one that we discovered a few years ago. It's a ship that we found. We have a research vessel and we do have an ongoing uh, underwater uh, marine operations uh, arm of our operations overall. But uh, there is a vessel called the Nelson. And uh, I referenced that I showed this slide a little bit earlier and I made a reference to it uh, right as we started the program. It was built in Milwaukee in 1866. And uh, when it was first built as a barkentine, it was considered one of the prettiest vessels sailing on the lakes. That's an artist's conception, obviously, but look how pretty. You can see the pennant flying with the name Nelson on it right there. And a newspaper reporter called it one of the hands, called it the handsomest model of a bark, meaning a barkentine in this case, ever built uh, in Milwaukee. That was April of 1866. Like so many of these other shipwrecks, um, the Nelson had its share of accidents, uh, a collision, uh, hit, hit the lock wall at one point, sank soon after, uh, things like that. It had problems. But uh, 1899, and again, we're shifting forward here, 1899, it really got into trouble. And this is Sault Ste. Marie. This is August 3rd, 1890. But I like to show this slide, not only because you could see the Nelson now is no longer a barkentine. And you remember I said a barkentine was essentially a schooner uh, with a square rigged foremast. So in essence, we could just say a schooner. And uh, this is another vessel called the Mary B. Mitchell. And uh, this is a ship that you can see in front of them. If I can get my cursor to, uh, to show that. Uh, bah, that's not what I wanted to do. There you go, right there. That's a vessel called the A. Folsom. That was a steamship that would pull the Mary B. Mitchell and the Nelson. And uh, this was May, we're talking about, mid-May 1899, not in this picture, but the story I'm about to tell about the shipwreck of the Nelson. Mid-May, lovely weather, upbound with a load of coal. Each one of these vessels headed to Lake Linden, headed to the Keweenaw Peninsula. So they'd pass the shipwreck coast, they'd pass Marquette, you know, munising all these places and head their way past, uh, on their way to the Keweenaw Peninsula. This is the A. Folsom. It was a lumber hooker, wooden steamship uh, designed to haul lumber, thus the name. And look at the, look at the stacks of lumber. You can see behind it there. And uh, pretty typical for vessels like this to um, have big tow bits uh, that they would uh, tie these very, very heavy ropes to that they would end up towing these vessels with. So mid-May 1899, um, and you can see this picture right here. Probably somebody stepped out of the pilot house of a vessel like the Folsom. This is not the Folsom. It's not the Mary B. Mitchell, and it's not the Nelson, but it gives you an idea of what it might have looked like when these uh, steamers were pulling these um, schooner barges. You know, it would have almost been like a parade passing places like Whitefish Point with all these vessels tied with ropes, of all things, um, and uh headed out to the Keweenaw Peninsula in this case. Well, when they left Sault Ste. Marie, um, it was a Friday, if I recall the story, by Saturday afternoon, they were off of Whitefish, or actually would have been Saturday morning, they were off of Whitefish Point, and by the time they made the turn to head into the upper lake and start heading west to head out towards the Keweenaw, the weather started to get really bad. It started to get worse and worse, and the captain of the Folsom, uh, a man by the, uh, the name of A.E. White. And I'm just wondering, um, I don't think the rest of you can see it, but my screen sharing uh, navigation panel at the top is gonna make, me hard, make it hard to read this. But um, Captain uh, White of the Folsom, basically these are his words. He was interviewed after they got back to Sault Ste. Marie after the tragedy, but he writes, uh, it was a bitter gale. I can't see the rest of this, <laughs> says A.E. White, uh, of the Folsom in relating the disaster. Then he went on to say, the wind blew 50 miles an hour from the northwest and it was freezing cold. The seas froze over everything when they broke aboard and everything became covered with ice. Early yesterday afternoon, the wind and sea became too severe to steam into any longer, and I determined to put the tow about and run back. I was watching the barges and saw the Mitchell make the turn successfully. The Nelson hung a little and as soon the space between her and the Mitchell widened and it was certain the tow line had parted. So what was happening here was they were, they were heading west, the weather was getting nastier, nastier, ice was forming on the decks and uh, Captain White on that steamship, if you could imagine him for a minute in the pilot house, he can see the ice forming on the decks He's looking back through his binoculars, uh, through his telescope, trying to see the other two, his consorts, as they would call them, uh, to see if they were still there. And uh, he figured at one point, look, 
we're going to have to turn around. We can't, we, we're not making any headway. So that's exactly what he did. And again, imagine what's going through his mind and imagine what's going through the mind of the captain of the Mary B. Mitchell and a man by the name of Andrew Hagany, who was the captain of the Nelson. This is a, the most dangerous maneuver they're going to make as they're trying to make a turn in the storm like this, much less having tow lines holding them all together. The Mitchell made it. I'm sure Captain White was uh, maybe a little bit relieved at that first part, but by the time the Nelson started making the turn and he, he makes that reference to the space between her widening and the Mitchell and that instantly that tow line had parted. And so at this point, Captain Hagany and his crew of six or eight, depending on which newspaper source of the day that you believe, uh, were scrambling to uh, get some sail up and try to do something about their situation. Captain White went on to say in this newspaper article that the Nelson turned uh, toward the shore. I'm trying to read this past this uh, panel here and think her captain intended to beach her. I had supposed until then that she was in good shape as they'd made no signals. Uh, before we were aware of the danger, she, she began sinking and in a few minutes she dove to the bottom. The crew did not even have time to lower the all boat. Uh, I can't read that because of these blocking, but he says the wreckage was, no no wreckage was left to mark the spot and the Nelson disappeared as quickly as one could snuff out a candle. So from his vantage point, watching it, they could still see the Nelson and from his vantage point, it looked like it sank immediately. Well, that's not exactly what happened. Um, matter of fact, if you take a look uh, right there, you can see an artist's conception of what was happening after the tow line parted. That is the Nelson right there. Uh, artist by the name of Robert McGreevy uh, captured this pretty well based on uh, some eyewitness accounts, newspaper articles. There was one survivor from the Nelson. And what it's hard to tell, you can see here, they tried to get sail up to try to improve their position. There's a big donkey uh, engine right there, steam engine, it's still on the deck today. And there on the stern, you can see the davits, you can see that cabin right there, and there you can see uh, the lifeboat. And Captain Hagany, hard to tell, but he's hanging off of the stern in that image. What ended up happening was, I, I'm sure Captain Hagany tried to get his crew into action to try to save their ship, but I think before he realized it, that ship was sinking out from underneath them. So he ordered everybody to the lifeboat. The lifeboat was hanging from those davits at the stern. Now, here's the sad thing. You know, some of these wrecks are tragic, period. Most of them are. The ones where an entire crew, like the Phineas Marsh, they survive, that's, a, that's an upside for sure. I mean, that's, well, it's more than an upside. It, it kind of, the human factor, everybody was saved. That's the most important thing. In this case, Captain Hagany had his wife on board. She was the cook and their infant child was on board as well. So he got his wife and child on board that vessel. He lowered it. He had to stay on board the ship uh, in order to lower it. And then the only choice he really had at that point, they had to keep a line attached to the ship itself, to the lifeboat, and then he was going to jump overboard. Think about that. This is mid-May. Um, ice is probably still floating around out there in some places. And what he was going to do, and there is a closer image you can see right there, jump overboard. By the time he did, and no doubt his breath was absolutely taken away when he hit that water. By the time he surfaced, the stern of the Nelson was rising up. That line, unfortunately, tragically, was still attached to the lifeboat that has family and his crew on board. And that ship dove for the bottom at that point. And it took, he never saw any of the crew, didn't see his family again, nobody. But what ended up happening was, and if you take a look, uh, right here is that stern cabin. There's the ship's wheel right there. When that ship dove for the bottom, the uh, pressure built up inside the hull of the vessel, that cabin popped off and floated. And, and for Captain Hagen, he was fortunate that he was able to get onto that cabin and floated ashore and got within a few miles of the Deer Park Life Saving Station, whereupon at that point he started walking. He knew where he was, but he was probably in a state of shock. He was suffering from exposure. You can only imagine the psychological trauma this man had from watching his family disappear uh, in front of him, but he was able to walk to the Deer Park Station. And this is a case where the crew, and I use this as an example, the crew uh, wasn't actively able to get their surfboat out and rescue his family and the crew uh, because they didn't even know it was out there. The only way they found out that the Nelson went to the bottom was Captain Hagany arriving, probably looking pretty dramatic, you can only imagine. 
And so they took him inside the station house. They were able to give him stimulants, quote unquote. Uh, who knows what that was, but get him next to a, a stove, warm him up so he could tell a story. And that story too also showed up in the year 1900, um, report to Congress of the life-saving service of the Vermilion Station. So again, you can cross-reference. You can look at newspaper articles from the day, but then go through these life-saving service uh, reports and you can find references to not all, but some of these shipwrecks. And that's one of my favorite pictures of the Deer Park Station, I have to say too. That's again, Muscalange Lake. You can see the lookout tower up there behind it. And you can see a good, good image of that station house right there. But chances are Captain Hagany wouldn't have survived either had that life saving station not been there. So this is what the Nelson looks like today. A few years ago, uh, the Shipwreck Society found that vessel. It's in about two, roughly 200 feet of water. We have a, an ROV, it's a small robot with uh, very intense lighting and high definition cameras. And as you look at this, there's part of the ship's wheel. That's where that cabin was that popped off that Captain Haggerty was getting get a hold of. The tow bits right here. Uh, those tow bits, the, the heavy, heavy rope would be tied to that. And so if there would have been another, uh, another schooner barge behind the Nelson, they would have tied that line to that. And there's part of the mast you can see. And then um, this, um, oh, what is it? A cap stand right here. You can see there's three cap stands that are still standing on the deck of that ship. Here's a closer view uh, of the ship's wheel. You can see it took some damage as that thing dove to the bottom. Again, we're talking May 1899. You can see part of the uh, mast that I showed you before, that capstan looming in the background, and there's those big heavy duty tow bits you can see right there. There's some of that coal that was destined for Lake Linden and the Keweenaw. It's still inside the hold, never got there. Part of an anchor. Uh, you can see, and, and there's a cat head, they call them right there, that the anchor would have, would have hanged from. Another part of a mast right there, too. Excuse me, and Bruce? I, yes. We, we're running a bit late, so we should probably wind up with your main points, um, if you don't mind. Sure, that's fine. That's fine. I'll make it quick here as I go through the last slides. We're getting close to the end here. There you can see the Nelson on the side of it. That's paint from 1899. You don't often find a shipwreck where you can get the name that clear. And then uh, Whitefish Point. We didn't have the life-saving service at Whitefish Point, which I mentioned earlier. You can see we had a Coast Guard lifeboat station. Look how different that looks from Whitefish Point of today. Here's a view from the tower. This is after 1923. Look at all those what appear to be Model A's out there. You can see the ship traffic in the distance. And I love this image right here too. Um, this again, post 1923, you can see our surf boat, our light boat house here, motor light boat, our surf boat house there. This is taken from the drill pole, another view looking back at the station itself. So it was a very busy station, a lot of buildings and they had a surf boat, much like the life-saving service. There's the surf boat house. That's what it looks like today. There's an interior shot with one of our staff members there. Uh, working this winter. There's our motor lifeboat house. We're restoring it. We moved it back to White Whitefish Point in 2013. That's what it looks like now. We're almost done with it. There's a gentleman by the name of Frank Mays. I don't know if any of you know Frank. He was one of the two survivors from the Carl D. Bradley. He did presentations for us. He just passed away this last year, uh, unfortunately. We are getting a motor, well, we have a motor lifeboat, uh, just like the one you see right there that we're in the process of restoring. And uh, there's what you can see, it's at Murtaugh Boat Works where they have the wooden boat show doing the work on it. There's the picture of what it looks like this last winter. It's come a long way. Uh, in just the last couple slides, I've been doing research in the National Archives and it tells you what daily life was like at these stations. Not a lot of excitement, a lot of training, but every so often there would be a shipwreck. And there you go, Barb, I wrapped it up uh, <laughs> pretty, pretty quickly, but, 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 uh, it gives you an idea, uh, all of these stories of that drama that was just offshore before and after the life-saving service and those Coast Guard lifeboat stations. So there you go. Uh, sorry I ran over a little bit, but... Um, Everyone was enjoying it so much, and I, I hated to cut you off, but I do want to ask that you send us those resources, and I can send out an e-blast to our friends. Absolutely. And so if you could list the books that you were talking about, that'd be wonderful. And then if you want to include a link to your um, museum or any great videos that you have, we'd love to share those as well. That's how I can definitely do that. I will get that out to you. And if anybody has any questions for me, uh, you know, 
uh, our number here at the shipwreck offices, that'll be on that email too. An email and all that stuff is fine. Wonderful. Are there any last questions while we've got folks on, while we've got Bruce on? Jane Perkis, our curator, made a note that there were two US life, US life saving stations in Bensie County, one at Point Bensie and one at South Frankfurt. And of course, you can learn more about those here at our museum. But you have a lovely museum there. I'd like to go back. It, it's been a few years since I've been there, so I'm, I'm eager to go back. The well, we're open, calling. we're open on May 1st, uh, so come on up. It tends to be a little more quiet in May. Uh, but either way, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about all of this. And uh, thank you, everybody, for, uh, for joining the program. Thank you so much, Bruce. Thank all you. Right. <laughs> thank you very much. There's Don and Wiley. Hi, Don and Wiley. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. And we hope you'll join us next month on May 13th for Dr. Trisha Franzen. And I know that Jane Perkis is especially uh, looking forward to um, introducing um, Trisha to us um, as she's from her alma mater of Albion. And I think we've got a few other Albion folks on the line. So thank you, everybody. It's good to see you, Don and Wiley, and everybody else. And uh, we'll see you next month. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye.